Hello everybody, um, I'm Amy Hearn, that's me, and I'm a development librarian for Kirklees Libraries. Kirklees is around the Huddersfield area, sort of up to Cleckheaton, if you know where that is, and down to Home Fair, if that's still some wine. Um, yeah, um, so I've got responsibility for learning, digital and health at Kirklees Libraries, and I work across 24 libraries and do the strategic development and decide what we're doing. Basically, pretty much the boss, but... Not quite. Um, and I'm going to talk about lending microbits today. So can I just ask, how many people know what microbits are and are all like all that? Because I can just skip through that stuff. OK, quite a few people. I'll, I'll skim quite a lot. And actually, I'm not, um, I'm not a professional coder. I'm not um, incredibly techy. So mm -hmm. Michael over here is a person to ask. Phil is the person to ask, and Lorraine is also really good to ask as well, not me. I know what I know on here, nothing else. So, a microbit is, well, it's not even, I don't even know what it is. Is it a little computer? Is it a little con a microcontroller? What is it? Microcontroller. So, basically, it's this, and it does all sorts of cool stuff, and it's nice and cheap, and it's nice and tactile uh, for people to use. So, microbits are really cool because they're super small, so they're easy to carry around. We keep them in these cute little Tupperwares, really easy to put on a shelf. Um, they're easy to send between libraries. They're super simple. They've got um, block coding behind them. They're really easy to use, and unlike things like Raspberry Pi, which are awesome, these... Um, there's less fear to have to deal with. So if you're learning something new, it's a really good place to start. I think people look at Raspberry Pi and they sort of freak out because it does so many different things. Um, these are a really good place to start. They're super cheap, they're like 15 pounds, or if you know Phil, no pounds. And um, so it means that if you're lending them or using them with kids, they're really inexpensive to be able to replace. And in fact, the, the whole set is 15 quid, but the board itself is like 12 or something. And then you've got the, um, mini USB and stuff like that so if they're super cheap you don't have to worry about kids wrecking them but they don't I'll get to that bit and they're super supported so there's loads and loads of materials available online for you to learn how to use microbit there's microbit.org which is the official microbit website it's got loads of stuff and they sort of pull loads of different things together um, I've got some examples from Code Club over on the tables for you to have a look at if you want to have a try later. But also, there's loads of people that are really into microbits online, including Michael and Lorraine. And they're available at all hours to, <laughs> for you to get in touch with and say, hey, I'm stuck with this, or I need some idea on how I can fit this into whatever I'm doing at the moment. Just like tweet, use the CasChat hashtag, and they will just tweet you back with loads of awesome ideas. I just nick people's ideas all the time. They're really tactile, so what I like about them is that um, unlike things like Scratch, Scratch is cool, everyone starts with that, that's all right, but for me, it's all on screen and I don't really get it. With this, one of the um, Code Club workshops that I've brought today is the, um, uh, a game where it's, you see who's the fastest to press a button. And you can do it as an adult that knows what they're doing in like 15 minutes and you're playing a physical game that you've made that you can take and show to your mate and play something physical that's a real thing that you've made. And I think that's awesome. Um, and they're super versatile. So you can use them. Um, there's apps that you can use them with. Um, you can use them on anything, really. They've got Bluetooth and loads of other stuff that I'm going to go in. They've got all sorts of things. And they're teeny tiny, so they're wearable as well. So you can, like, and they come, they've got a nice battery pack. You can attach them to stuff, fix them to yourself, all that kind of thing. They can control everything that you're doing. So this is the, um, the sort of basic block coding that you can use. It's a lovely drop and drag. You can see over at the side, you've got the different, if you know what you're doing with Scratch, you know what you're doing with this, and you can really quickly get going and do something really cool. They also do loads of stuff, even though they're super tiny. So this is where, if you have corrections, people on the front row, save it till the end, because... <laughs> You can all have discussions as to whether this is right. Okay. So it knows which way it's going. It's got an inbuilt compass. 
It knows how fast it's going. So you can use it to do all types of science experiments. It knows how much time has lapsed, so it can count things. It knows the temperature, kind of. I don't know whether it really does. It does, it does know the temperature, so you can get it to assess the temperature of stuff. It knows the light levels, knows whether it's light or it's dark. And it's got buttons that you can press that do stuff. So this is, um, I've just picked this up from the library, so this has got some kids code on it. So if, it presses, if I press a button, hopefully it won't do anything too dramatic. It's doing an arrow, that's cool. So you can press a button and you can make it do stuff. You can shake it and it will do other things if you've told it to do it. It's got a sad face now, so I'll shake it. Um, and it's got these pins here that you can break out of as well. So it's got loads and loads of functionality. So it's also really super engaging. So this is, these are some figures from the Microbit Foundation themselves. We know what they're talking about. And um, the Microbit showed them that anyone can code. It showed them that coding is exciting. And it showed girls that I'm particularly interested in that coding is something that they should want to do. And I think that's because it's creative and it's physical and they can get, it's like instant gratification in the coding world. And with the whole drag and drop, there's no annoying, you didn't put a full, step in, full stop in there or this is semicolon off and it doesn't work, which I get stressed out with. So basically, how did we end up putting micro bits in 1200 libraries in the UK and now all over the world? This is an advert from Leicestershire Council, which I thought was nice. And it fit in with the colours of my slides, so that's good. So it's all down to Michael. This is Michael, looking super handsome. And no, that's the best that I could do. Um, so basically, when I started my job as development librarian with responsibility for digital and learning, I met Michael, who was already running a Raspberry Jam and a Code Club at our central library, and had been doing quite quietly for about two years with very little support from our staff because they didn't really know what was happening. I think they were just happy for Michael to come in and use the space and do something that was a bit technical. They didn't really know what it was, but they knew it was cool, and then leave again. But I decided to actually speak to him. And he um, showed me a micro bit, which was brand new. In fact, did you bring one, or did you just talk about it? I think you just described it, because I think they, it was in that time where you couldn't get them because people knew about them, but you couldn't get them. They were like super rare. So it was like, you should definitely order one off Amazon um, because it's a really good place to get started because I had code in, in my remit and didn't know anything about it. So I did, and this is a quote from Michael. If you have an idea, then keep your mouth shut because it can escalate quite quickly. That's only if you're around me for the most part. I'm an enabler. In a good and a bad way. So basically, we bought some micro bits and started lending them. Um, and that caused a little bit of a stare because no one had really lent any sort of IT equipment before. And Phil picked up on it, I don't know how. My parents live in Holmford and they need tweeted about the Holmford Library. Oh yeah, I do remember. Yeah. So we just happened to have someone super important for the Microbit Foundation in our area. So he picked up on it. And he helped us start a little bit of a pilot with Blackpool, Coventry, Newcastle, and South End libraries, which were a combination of library people that I knew that I knew would be enthusiastic and run with it and make it work, and people that um, Philip already knew that would do the same. And it went really well. Um, and then we sort of widened it out a bit just to make sure that that wasn't just a little, a little a blip in the figures because we had super enthusiastic people behind it and got some other slightly less enthusiastic but still albeit keen people behind it and that went really well so we got we told more people about it and they applied so these are all different council authorities that have bought into um lending microbits from their libraries so some of them we basically we offered a set of 10 microbits to each library that they wanted to lend from so within their authority, that could be as many libraries as they wanted. Might be all of them, might just be some of them. Um, the biggest I think that we have had up to date is Essex with something like 70 libraries and they've chosen to lend from all of them. Um, and then it got a bit worse. And we've got a few more. Um, and that's, in, in England, we've got pretty much three quarters of all Council authorities lending microbits over the course of a year, which I think is pretty cool. 
and from basically not doing very much at all, apart from sitting back and waiting for people to hear about it and apply to do it, um, and people asking how they could be part of it. And we've recently just moved into Wales, as you can see, and a bit of Scotland, and Northern Ireland, and that looks tiny, but actually Northern Ireland is just one authority, which I didn't know until this. So we've got the whole of Northern Ireland in one fell sweep, which was pretty cool. And it's gone international now. I'll tell you about that in a bit. So they're all um, lending micro bits. So why is it good for libraries? Well, for a start, we were struggling with coding and with digital stuff. We knew it was something that we should be doing. The managers knew it was something they should be doing. The general people who decide what libraries should be doing knew it was something they should be doing. But we're librarians, you know? We like the quiet and books and that kind of thing. We don't really, but we do kind of. Um, nobody really knew what they were doing, so we were struggling. And things were happening, but it was people like Michael who were doing it quietly and just not really getting in anyone's way. So it was happening. It was okay. But this was something that librarians could buy into and the the was a really enthusiastic community behind the um, just really super flourished. So as soon as we started lending micro bits, people picked up on it straight away. All of the techie people and the coding people and the people that are into infusing and engaging people and children with coding were just really into it and got it straight away. And the initial driving force was less about libraries wanting to do it, even though it was totally to their benefit, and more about the volunteer community wanting to come forward and offer this opportunity to the people that were living in their areas. And that's really brilliant. It's pretty much a grassroots uprising, which I think is awesome. These are all people that have been involved from pretty much the start, but still all the time we get people picking up on it, tweeting their library authority, why don't you have this, we need this, telling everybody about it, and that's brilliant. Um, so Les is a coder, hacker from Blackpool area. He's really into everything, and he said this really long quote, but basically it's really rewarding if you're a volunteer to be able to bring this sort of technology to children that are really going to be able to benefit from it. So we were just had some secret sponsors who were paying for microbits to be in UK libraries. And we were sort of saying to other libraries across the world, well, sorry, it's just UK only um, because of money. So they went ahead and in some places just raised their own money. So this is a group in Sri Lanka and off the back of their government putting them in the schools. Who put them in the schools? Some other secret sponsors put them in the schools. Um, sixth grade? Government. It's not official yet. But okay. It happened anyway. Um, this is a user group who um, have done some funding and got them into libraries and basically engaged um, people in Sri Lanka with microbits. And also, the Croatian Makers Movement, who, um, again, they started in the schools and they have now crowdfunded and, I don't know whether you'll be able to see, but anyway, they've got more money than they need to be able to do what they want to do, which is brilliant. So it's all happening from a grassroots, which I think is really cool. So, libraries benefit. So, when we started putting microbits in libraries, to be honest, lots of library people freaked out a little bit because it's way beyond librarians' comfort zones for the most part. Like, it's really scary. They don't know what any of this stuff is. They don't do any of this stuff. We can do stuff about literacy and we can do cutting and sticking, like making little sheep that fit in with story times. So we can do that really well. But when it comes to digital stuff, people aren't great. But they've really got behind it. So this is a group of library staff who some of their volunteers have come together and trained to be able to use micro bits. Part of the battle has been explaining that actually you don't need to be able to use it to be able to promote it. You just need to be able to know what it does and you need to be able to uh, signpost people online, which is information finding, which is what librarians do. But they've really got behind it from a tenuous start. These are some librarians that are just loving having micro bits in their life, including um, a display at Dewsbury, which is where I used to work, which is really cool. And that micro is like this big. And the library assistant did it off her own back. It's really good. They're really excited. Um, 
and yeah, Andy from South End, who did some training with some, everyone who works in libraries is a middle-aged woman, pretty much. Um, and they've all got on board with it too. They like the flashing lights, well, who doesn't? And uh, yeah, this is our day. Hashtag our day is a thing where if you work in the local government, you can go on Twitter and everyone can find out about all the cool things that you do, even though you're just a librarian. And they were bragging about how they were doing their first coding with microbits, which I thought was really sweet. Um, blah, 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 blah. This is a librarian who, yeah, so what I liked about this was that she's had people come and tell her about her coding triumphs that they've had, which she doesn't know anything about. But she encourages them anyway. I think that's really nice. Um, and they're going to buy some more microbits. They want more than 10. So it's helped us increase our digital making activity. This is a little girl from Batley Library. Look how happy she is mm -hmm. to be doing something with a microbit. So happy. And that's because having something small and relatively simple to be able to focus on has meant that we can upskill ourselves to be able to offer more opportunities. I think there was so much available, people didn't really know what to do, it was all really scary, but they could use Microbit, they know where they're going, the code club stuff, you literally just follow exactly what it says and you're okay. They all love coming to code club. So yeah, we did have a few code clubs and stuff kicking around, um, but they didn't have much support, much equipment, and this has really helped them. We've also done some work with schools. Um, as you will know, lots of teachers, um, computing teachers even, are sort of floundering with the change to the curriculum. And it's meant that we've been able to support schools to be able to teach computer science. Something that librarians are quite good at is cross-curricular stuff, which I think especially primary teachers, um, sometimes the teachers that I've seen have struggled to make the connection is how Coding can be just as much a cross-curricular activity as crafting can be. You've just got to be able to see the right angle. Um, so we've been training teachers. We're in Kerclees as well. We're starting a digital leaders library card, which means that you can borrow more micro bits for longer and you can borrow more coding books and any other stuff that we might choose to lend. Let's use that last minute equipment budget before the end of the financial year. Um, And it's also meant that we've had loads of new members and loads of new partners. Uh, doing coding activities and offering microbits has meant that new people have come to the library. New people have joined the library. Um, and we've reached out to, to different audiences altogether, really. Everyone's been super enthusiastic about it. It definitely has brought in the non-traditional library users, as we would say. Um, and they've been really popular. To be honest, the popularity depends on the enthusiasm of the person that is promoting it because they're tiny and they're in a little plastic box. So if you want to hide them away in a cupboard, you can. And if you want to just tuck them behind something and not really tell people about it, they're hard to be able to stumble upon. But if you tell people about it um, and, they, and you promote it, then they go really, really well. And these are just some of the authorities where they've been absolutely flying off the shelves um, and helping our issue figures, which we all know libraries are struggling all over the place. Um, and they've allowed, and they, what's my next slide? And they've been really good, basically. So some of the other things that we're doing in Kegley's libraries around coding. So um, hands on coding. So we've got, loads of coding activities so this is you can see michael just in the background there this is michael's code club or jam one of the jams um oh yeah the christmas decorations um yeah so we basically just had michael but now that we've had microbits and we've had something for staff and other volunteers to focus on, we've had something that we can train them on and lots of people have come forward and had the confidence to be able to volunteer and, and do stuff with them, with kids and adults around coding. And we've got other stuff as well. So these are little bits. And I basically just put this in because look at that picture. Look at that dad with his little boy 
doing stuff with the little bits. Super cute. So little bits, um, it's basically electronics, but it's in sections and it um, magnetizes together. So it's like simple electronics. Yes, they do. So in a um, school pack, in a, in a classroom pack, you get six buzzers. And if you connect all six buzzers together, it buzzes six times the amount. <laughs> Normally, someone finds that out pretty quickly. But they're not only looking, they, they, they then learn how to put a, volume, a slight volume slider and how to control the volume of it. So then they can go, <laughs> which is really and not annoying at all. <laughs> they like the buzzers. But they can also invent some super cool stuff as well. And loads of microbit workshops, because although the microbits are really popular, they're never more popular than when Michael's helping children use them and promoting them. So in half term, I don't know if anyone has children that live in the Kirklees area, Michael's doing eight workshops for free. They're free to you, not to me. Um, <laughs> where you can learn about how to use microbits. And we're doing some coding with under fives as well, which I don't know if anyone's particularly interested in. I'm stood at the front, so you have to listen to me. So, um, coding for under fives, it's not real coding. It's teaching the functional skills that will make somebody a better coder when they're more than five, basically. So, um, some of the toys that we've got, and again, I think this is just an excuse to get that little girl in the middle on the screen, because look at her. Come on. So, we've got Coder Pillar, which is just a Fisher-Price toy. Um, so really easy to get and it's a caterpillar that comes into sections and each section has got a direction on it. You connect them together by USB and then you press go and it follows the segments in whatever order you've put them in. But it makes a cute caterpillar tune and it wiggles like a caterpillar. Adorable. No? You have to sellotape over, sellotape over the speaker. It does not have a volume control. It's still quite loud, even with the cellar tip. It's a bit quieter when the volume switch is not Yeah. Um, and then the middle one, that's B-Bot. So it's a little B, and it, they have those in school. So on its back, it's got direction controls. You press those, and it remembers what you've pressed. So there's like a step away from it in that you have to remember that you've pressed forward, forward. And rather than if you press turn, it turns on its axis rather than turning around something. So it's, and it's got a footprint. So you can get it to, you can make a maze or whatever, and you can code it around. Code a you can't really, it's just going off in the general. It's big. Um, and then Cubetto. So you see the little, well, cube at the top, the smaller one, that's a little robot, and it's got a little mat. And then the, the bigger one at the bottom, those tiles are all different directions. So you can start putting, uh, well, like formulas and functions, basically, as you place the tiles um, and you press it and it will go. So what we're doing with those is I'm trying to embed coding into our library practice as much as possible. So it's not a special add on thing that we don't have to do or that people come in just to do a coding. I want it to be again, I keep comparing it to crafting because we wouldn't think anything of doing of sticking some cotton wool on a sheep cut out as part of a story time, but people think that coding's a really special thing. So it's a caterpillar. Obviously, it's a very hungry caterpillar. Um, so we already tell the story of a very hungry caterpillar. We already add in multi-sensory elements where people taste the food that's been, um, that the caterpillar is eating, and we have plushy caterpillars and all that kind of stuff. So having the coder pillar and having the parents put out the different food shapes and getting them to send the caterpillar off to eat them is just embedding it within a story time that they already do, but adding those elements that will make, help people be better coders when they're older. Um, this is a book called The Giant Jam Sandwich. So this is one of my favorite ones that our staff have adapted the storytelling to be able to use coding with. Because obviously a bee bot is a wasp when you're telling the giant jam sandwich. Because basically a village make a giant loaf of bread. So obviously they decide to make a giant jam sandwich. And then of course it's summer so it gets attacked by wasps. So we tell the story and we have two cream bath mats that are, that are slices of bread. 
and one red bath mat that is a slice of jam and that's a giant sandwich and we have that oh come on of course it is and we have a giant um checkered piece of cloth which is a giant tablecloth and we have the people from cut out from the book that are trying to swat the wasps and then you've got your bee bot so the parents of the three-year-olds or whatever work with them to direct the bees towards a sandwich so it's like coding preparation by stealth basically <laughs> is what we're trying to do and then finally we've got Huddersfield Girl Geeks which is my baby at the moment so girl, I don't know whether you've heard of the Girl Geek sort of movement, but it's like a national thing. Um, and there's lots of different branches. Manchester and Liverpool are the two most prevalent ones around this area. And we've just started a Huddersfield one. So it's basically about inspiring, supporting and uniting women and girls interested in STEM and digital. So it's about, um, it's about giving them opportunities to learn. It's about giving strong female role models like Lorraine. And it's about giving them aspirations to work in STEM um, areas. So we're doing a bunch of workshops. The next one, this is uh, Huddersfield University. Part of their setup, they've got an innovation centre where they've got loads of professional 3D printing stuff that's not open to the public um, and is pretty snooty, to be honest. And over half term, <laughs> Well, the guy that runs it is called Michael and he's in his 50s. And when I said I was doing Huddersfield Girl Geeks, he said, but who will think of the boys? <laughs> <coughs> but no one that's a girl works there, though. Um, but he has kindly, over two days, opened up his facility for some women to go in and learn 3D mapping and um, printing as well over two days. So we're trying to go into those closed off places and give people opportunities to, to be able to get involved. A lot of men's there's a lot of mansplaining, just like when we were on our way here, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> also talks... <laughs> that little mic drop. Um, also talks, so this is a local games company called Ocean Spark, and we've got Helen and Ellie, um, and they're directors of a games company, and they're doing really well, and they're in their 20s and um, they came and did a talk about what it was like to go and study games when there was sort of 5% of the course were female and it was really intimidating, but also what it's like to be in your early 20s and be director of a company um, and all sorts of different things like that. So yeah, positive role models and aspiration <laughs> is what we're about. Social stuff. So we did a launch um, a digital launch in October for Code Week with a little bit of funding from Google. And these are some of the girls that came to our Code party and um, had a really good time. And we brought together people from the university. We brought together people from Code Club and all sorts of digital makers in the vicinity. Um, and put on a load of workshops, basically, that people could, that girls, open to all, but aimed at girls and women, could come and try stuff out. <laughs> and it was really good. It was a really good day. Um, there's Lorraine. You can't see how flashy her skirt was in that picture. It's too light. Um, and you can't see how flashy my hat was as well. It was really flashy. Talk to Lorraine later. Um, we did lots of stuff around shining lights because who doesn't like shining lights? But it was really brilliant and we brought together loads and loads of girls um, and teenage girls who might not have seen digital encoding as something for them. We sort of tried to target it more at creativity than digital to be able to attract a new audience and I think we are really successful from that. And I think that is, yes, my last slide. So I went off piece a little bit at the end, but um, yeah, micro bits and libraries. So we've got some micro bits over there. I haven't brought anything for you to use them on, but if you've got a laptop or um, a tablet or anything like that, and we've got some worksheets as well. So if you want to make something with a micro bit, then please do. Thank you very much.